Uh, I am Susanne Berry, and I'm with the Durham Friends Meetings Earth Care Witness Committee. And our committee engages the meeting in considering our spiritual relationship to the earth and developing sustainable ways of living with the earth. Uh, so let's get on with our presentation. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Jenny Radcliffe. And Jenny is an environmental research epidemiologist of 45 years, a longtime Quaker, and a lifetime activist. She's also written a wonderful book called Nothing Lowly in the Universe, An Integral Approach to the Ecological Crisis. And especially for those of us in, in faith communities, uh, Jenny does a wonderful job throughout the whole book talking about really it's the spiritual part of this dilemma that uh, we're in um, that sometimes prevent us from honoring the, the earth. And she'll talk about that. Jenny has researched and reflected about fossil fuel divestment and how critical it is towards mitigating the effects of climate change. Jenny will speak to the spiritual ground of our concern about the climate crisis and summarize new data on current and planned fossil fuel investments around the world and why individually divesting from fossil fuels, supporting divestment campaigns, and reinvesting in environmentally responsible funds are among the most effective environmental actions we can take. Thank you for the, um, the introduction, Suzanne, and, and thank you, uh, Lynn, for co-hosting, co-sponsoring co this, actually. So, and it's a pleasure for every, to see everybody here. And what's the what, why and how of fossil fuel divestment and reinvestment? What exactly do we mean by that? Let's just be clear about the um, what we mean by divestment in this particular case when we're talking about fossil fuels is moving money from banks, investments of various sorts, whether it, those are um, held either individually or by institutions like academia, businesses, municipalities, and so on, pension funds, other investment funds, and moving them away from any funds that, that are contributing to fossil fuel development or use. And reinvestment is basically putting that money into renewables or other ecologically just and sustainable funds. And that actually is going to include, if you broaden it out, it's, it's going to include funds that are to do with climate mitigation, adaptation and the protection of life. So it's a pretty broad kind of reinvestment pattern that you can take. And um, just to note that thinking of that part of it, it just came out today, the United Nations Environment Programme has said that financing for climate adaptation is of only about 5 to 10% of what we actually need to be doing right now. There's um, plenty of room for helping the people who suffer the most from the climate crisis and have actually done the least to contribute to it, as m many of us already know. There are various grounds for divesting from fossil fuels, and they, these are uh, ecological, political grounds, and which most people would be thinking about. And there's also the moral and spiritual grounds. And I'll say this now, and I'll say it at the end too, that when, when, when I start to talk about the money that's involved, we are talking about trillions of dollars worth of investments in fossil fuels. And when you look at your own investments, or even if you were a Harvard school or, or a, um, a, a New York pension fund or something like that, you might think, well, this is a, a very, very tiny sort of drop in the bucket compared to what's being invested in fossil fuels. But um, um, as Britain Yearly Meeting wrote recently, and I think it's well worth bearing in mind that divestment is primarily a moral and political position to weaken um, the fossil fuel corporations public and moral position it's not necessarily to hurt them financially it would be you know it takes a massive amount of um, money to start making a dent into the investments but it it doesn't it doesn't necessarily take that's not exactly the point of divesting especially if you do it as a faith-based community which many of us are trying to figure out how to do. Um, so just to briefly go back over 
why would we want to divest? And I'll tell you a few things that are actually uh, well known to many of us, but they're worth realizing again, because we're, we're facing a particularly pivotal point in the climate crisis, which you'll see in a minute. So here's the bad news. This is a paper that just came out from James Hansen, who some of you might know, he's a climate scientist, showing that if you look at the, um, the red uh, line on the graph, I don't know if you can see my cursor here, but um, this is the, along the bottom, it's number of months. So we're talking about September was the last time they put the, when they put this graph up. And that was the hottest month ever recorded in human history. And in some people's view, it was because of the way we can look back in um, history um, to ice, ice cores and various other means of figuring out what temperatures used to be like. It may be the hottest month and the hottest summer for about 125,000 years. And we temporarily went over the 1.5 degree mark that has been used by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and many scientists as the kind of break point that we want to stay under if we're going to have a livable planet. And so it was a record year for extreme weather events as well. And we've, we've got, now we've got many climate refugees, um, 34 million children in it are estimated over the past six years. And we're very close to, and in some cases we're passing these what are called tipping points on our global system. So we're in danger of losing the West Antarctic ice sheet. We've got permafrost melt. The Amazon rainforest is, uh, is actually in greater danger than most people realized. And we've, we've already lost a lot of biodiversity. So here's some of the rapidly increasing severe uh, weather events. And this is just for the US. And these are the ones that have cost a billion dollars or more. And you can see that it's very clear from uh, uh, those different colored lines just mean different years. And as we've gone up to the last one, um, the uh, number of events is getting worse. And as, um, most people are aware of that now. <clears throat> so we also know that fossil fuels are responsible for about 80 to 90% of global heating. They're not the, in, entirely the only thing that causes global heating, but they are the, the major cause of the climate emergency that we're in. The in, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is what the IPCC stands for, say that we must keep 80%, at least 80% of the remaining fossil fuels, that's all the fossil fuels that we haven't yet burned, must stay in the ground if we're gonna even have a half a percent chance of staying under two degrees. And we're, we may have even less chance of staying under 1.5 right now. And to quote the International Energy Agency, we must rapidly phase out and replace all fossil fuels if we're going to if if we're going to have a chance of not exceeding 2.5 centigrade by the end of this century, and that's the these are the latest reports from these um, organisations, and um, the latest report from a, a paper in Nature just came out um, in September suggests that we've got to keep virtually all of the coal use. Um, that, that must that must um, almost be stopped immediately. So it's got to fall by 99% by 2050, um, oil by 70%, and, and some amount of gas is almost the same to, to keep our, our um, warming under 1.5 degrees. And so what, what the takeaway from this is, is that the speed of transition, the speed at which we move away from fossil fuels is the critical thing or is, is as critical as how much we get done. Because we're dealing with these tipping points, um, we're very close to. And if we don't get some of this done by 2050, there'll be so much baked into the system that we'll be in a kind of runaway emergency uh, situation. And as Bill McKibben says, Winning slowly now is the same as losing. That's his 
latest opinion. So what do we need to do? Actually, there's several things that we actually need to do in, in um, concert with each other. According, and this is a kind of general view of most of the climate scientists, not all, but, but the majority of people, we must not, we cannot expand or use existing uh, fossil fuel reserves. We've basically got to keep it in the ground. We've got to retire existing operations um, early um, if we're going to avoid 1.5 degrees of warming or more. We've got to increase um, energy, renewable energy investment by probably about 75% or more. And we in the richer countries have got to be reducing overall consumption and increasing efficiency of use. So we've got to really be doing all of those things. And one of, but one of the ways that we're, what we're going to talk about tonight is address the first one of those, which is how to, how to make sure that fossil fuels stay in the ground. So we can, if we look at the graph of fossil fuel use in the, the this is a this is a graph from the U.S., um, but it's actually very similar if you if you look at the worldwide picture. It's interesting. You can see that fossil fuels are still accounting for eighty about eighty percent of our of our energy use. Although, as you if you look at the bottom here, the little green um, curve here, um, renewables have been really taking off, but realistically, um, they've got a long way to go, obviously. And um, if you discount the nuclear component, which some people want to do, and I won't speak to that, but um, we, we could talk about that later. Um, uh, if you look at the clean energy renewables, they're only accounting still for about 13% of our energy use. So we've got an awful lot to do. This graph is, comes from the Energy Info Information Agency, by the way. But what are the fossil fuel companies doing? They are actually, um, rather than taking the, 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 the approach that they will start moving away from fossil fuels and investing in renewables, they're actually expanding, they're, they're planning a, a, a fairly substantial um, expansion of production over the next five years. It's probably going to look, look like a, about a trillion dollars or more. If, if you count up, it, it actually the, the, the exact amounts of money are rather difficult to, to, to um, nail down because some of the money goes for general operations, and and so and so a proportion of that goes specifically for a fossil fuel project. So it's a little bit hard to know what what in fact. If you had to divide the money up, it would be a little difficult to decide what was being actually used for what. But they but it's generally supporting those fossil fuel companies. So that's what we're really talking about here. We've also got the problem that right now. Whereas it used to be true of the U.S. and, and Europe, it's now um, India and China that are that are still heavily reliant on coal, which is the worst of the greenhouse gas producing fossil fuels. Um, and we've got the problem with actually steel and cement are, are huge users of um, greenhouse gases. And and in some countries it's coal it's coal that's providing the energy for steel, but at the same time only about a third of the world producers have got plans to go to net zero. So we we're seeing basically um, no no effective reduction in coal and about a thirteen percent expansion in oil and gas power plants. So that all sounds like bad news. And um, more bad news, if you want, if you want to think of it like that, is the the, the planned investments are actually in the to the tune of about three point six trillion higher than than if, they, if you were tra trying to get to net zero, you're actually going completely the other direction. So we've got the problem with the biggest fossil fuel corporations, um, as many of you probably read in the news um they made record profits last year and there have been some pretty substantial mergers um trying to think which one was the latest one exxon bought some um 
fracking company and um, sh maybe Chevron bought merged with somebody. So they're, they're actually getting more powerful and more monopolistic. So we've got a problem with the, the fact that little has been done so far to retire these plants. And, and by the way, one of the more greenwashing things, if you want to put it that way, that's going on is that a lot of these companies are now talking about carbon capture, even geoengineering as the as the way to get out of this problem and we um you cannot really find anyone who will admit that these te technologies have been a have not been proven at scale or b and or b uh, represent a huge risks for changing weather patterns around the world especially if you start talking about putting sulfur into the atmosphere and so on so it's become a kind of go-to shield for them to say, well, we can put it in the ground. We can get the fossil fuel, we can still get the fossil fuels out of the ground and we can still put the carbon back into the ground. And that simply is deceptive to put it mildly. So we've got this problem with these big funders and um, most of you will want to know that um, the uh, which are the biggest U.S. funders, and um, we, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And it's in the guide if you want to look up those banks. The biggest funders are the U.S. Um, actually funds a, a tremendous chunk of the worldwide fossil fuel funding. So we, we it, uh, as a single country, we provide about 30 percent of the of all corporate funding around the world. And we have some very big banks that have been doing that, um, which you can read there. And we have big managers and insurers, which are people like, um, or companies like BlackRock and Vanguard. And later on, I'll mention that one of the Quaker um, active groups, the um, Earthquake Action Team, have been specifically targeting Vanguard um, in, a, in a sustained campaign. Um, and here's a, an example of um, something else that's going on, which is that the, the banks in bold are of the first nine banks, it's either eight or nine banks, um, that are funding projects which are called carbon bombs, that which are going to put more than a gigaton of um, carbon into the atmosphere. The uh, about 60% of that money is coming from four, four of the banks that I just mentioned. And there's a lot of greenwashing going on in the sense that Wells Fargo, for example, when when I went and talked to the um, manager of my local branch, they uh, uh, to, to give them the letter of why I was divesting from them, um, they said, that they were very keen that people understood that they were investing in a lot of renewables. And, um, and so I asked them more about that and, and I looked it up on the web. And it's true that they have been putting, pledging, or pledging at any rate, to invest about $100 billion um, by 2028 in, into clean energy. So that's about 10 billion a year if they were actually if they're actually going to do it but at the same time as you can see from this slide they're actually still investing 45 billion a year on average although the time the time scales are a little bit different you can see that there there are about four times as much investments in fossil fuels as there are in clean energy but if you look, go on their websites, if you ever go um, on Citibank's website, you will you will see that they have got a very big presence in uh, renewables. They, 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 it's part of their advertising and part of their image. And so it is true that they're doing that, but it's a little bit like riding. I was trying to think of an analogy of this, but it's, it's a little bit like riding two horses that are, that are going in opposite directions. And you think that maybe you can do both. So it, based on that, it looks as if it's game over for the planet. But this is where the, um, the, both the practical and the 
moral and spiritual aspects of divesting come come into play and uh, and this is really the core of what why we're doing this as i said at the beginning it's not so much that we can that we can hurt if if you want to put it that way we can hurt the companies in actual dollar terms but there is a moral and spiritual ground for doing this work as faith communities and I want to speak to a little bit for that before I stop. So supposing we take this as our as our principles, and I, I wrote written about this in in the last book I wrote that we 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 stand with um, a fundamental sense of our interconnectedness, interdependence, and sacredness of life. So we're saying that all life has the fundamental intrinsic right to live and to flourish and to continue to, from one generation to the next. That would be one principle we could probably all stand by. And humans are in a felt bond of kinship with all life and with the, everything that supports life, where we are an integral part of the web of life and the whole Earth community, interdependent and interconnected in reciprocal Nonviolent and equal relationship forms the ground of why we would be concerned enough to do whatever we can to turn off the tap of what's heating the planet, what's destroying life, and what's jeopardizing the future for humans and all life on the planet. And let, let me just say a few things about Quakers in that respect. We have various sort of guiding principles, if you like, and those have been with Quakers for a very long time in many cases, since the inception of Quakerism. One of that one of them is we see that of the of God, the infinite, the source, the, the divine in everything. We're called to care for all creation and we and we are also called to be patterns and examples and let our own lives speak. So, and the British yearly meeting said, um, the guiding principle in making an income should be the good of the community and the effect of one's money on the welfare of all through its social and environmental impact. So in other words, what we do with our money should be, we should always be considering what the good of the community is and what and what impact our money is having on the wider community, meaning the earth community of which we're a whole part. So we have testimonies. These are the kind of central testimonies that Quakers would recognize that are about integrity, nonviolence, community equality, simplicity. The point I want to make here is that all of these are necessary they're they're in a sense integrity that in this sense the wholeness the interdependence the sacredness of the whole earth community is kind of in a very fundamental way is both the root and the branch and the fruit of this tree if you like and that nonviolence and community equality and simplicity are the ways in which we can express that to Bring about an earth restored. I've written a little bit about that in in my book. Well, actually, it's the sort of centre of the book. I take that as being the fundamental ground for doing something very, very practical, which Dale is going to talk to in a minute. We have often been um, conscientious objectors. The Quakers are known as conscientious objectors to wars and so on. But we are also conscientious protectors, and so, and we're also uh, when when you think about the um, the different testimonies of simplicity and equality and so on and community, we're very very concerned about e ecological justice and divesting, especially from our wealthier countries, is a matter of ecological justice. And here we've got some of the groups that we've been working with and. Um, point being here that we collaborate with different groups and the, the, so the last the last thing I want to just mention is 
evidence that the fossil fuel campaigns are working. And I think there's a lot of evidence that there is. There's, there's over 40 trillion worldwide has been committed to divestment efforts. Now, it hasn't all been, that, that 40 trillion is a huge amount of money. And I looked it up several times to, I thought, no, that can't be right. But um, in, there's a global divestment database has done all the work of pulling together what different organizations and pension funds and so on have, have put into this. And, and that's what it adds up to if you, took, if you take the whole worldwide commitments. So, and there are major campaigns in colleges, as most of us know. I was interested the, to find that state pension funds have been doing things like in New York, they've apparently just um, divested 20, 266 billion. Some cities even have pledged to divest. And then there's the, what Dale's going to talk about, which is really the nitty gritty of this, <laughs> is individuals working together um, or working as part of an organization or working one by one by one to pull our money out. Let the fossil fuel companies or let the banks in this case know why we're doing it. So we have some hopes because there's a chance that fossil fuels might be peaking. We want to see this reversed <laughs> in the next, well, if we, if we were lucky, we would be trying to do that in the next less than 10 years. But the, um, we can certainly try to do that by using these tools that we have. So um, I'll leave it at that for now. And Dale will take over and tell you how to do it. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Jenny. Um, and thanks for that PowerPoint presentation. A lot of information there, and it was good to see it visually, too, I must say. Um, so Dale Everts is a climate activist, and he was formerly with the EPA's uh, Climate International Group, and he, too, is a longtime Quaker. Dale will delve into our topic further with examples from financial institutions to corporations who fund and support the fossil fuel industry. Dale will provide some practical tips on how we can divest our financial assets, for example, those credit cards we have, bank accounts, investments, uh, from the financial institutions that fund fossil fuels. And then he's also going to share ways to sign up with national movements that are enlisting, you know, hundreds of thousands of people in this effort. Thanks, Suzanne, and thank you, Jenny, for the, uh, all that good information. I'm not sure how much of what Suzanne said I'm going to actually have time to do here, but and we have this great guide that we developed uh, last year and have revised, has a bunch of links. We'll we'll touch on those. But first, I want you to sit back and put yourself in the shoes of a fossil fuel executive. Think of what that person, where where that person has come from, what they've been managing. Think of not just the person sitting in that you know rich position right now, but the people that have sat in those positions over the last 100, 150 years since we've really, it's actually even more than that, since the industrial revolution and we began using fossil fuels to generate energy. That's something we're embarking. Stay with me here. <clears throat> You're a fossil fuel executive. You're making enormous profits, like Jenny has just said. Uh, you made the best profits ever this past year. Ukraine war hiked up prices. More and more people wanted gas and oil in other parts of the world. You're 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 doing great. Your stock stock prices are up. You're probably getting a big bonus this year. And and you don't see the end in sight, at least not on a quarterly basis. And here we come along. Here's this group of faith people coming along and telling you you need to divest from this from this cash cow. It's been your cash cow for 100 years, your company's cash cow for at least 100 years. Uh, and it has been the world's, you know, it's been the source of the world's energy for that long, it, much longer. The fact is, however, that uh, as the International Energy Agency proclaimed in, I think it was either 2020, yeah, three years ago now, uh, they proclaimed solar energy as being the cheapest source of energy that has been ever been developed by humans. That's your competition. And so you're going to do everything in your power to stop what we're trying to do. You're going to greenwash. You're going to say things like Jenny was pointing out that, 
oh, we're investing in clean energy, a fraction of what you're making and doing. You're going to try to pass laws to keep you from divesting or keep organizations or state treasurers or whatever, the, the various law, things that have been out there that uh, the fossil fuel industry and their enablers have tried to keep, keep from losing the funding they have. You're going to pay a lot of money to lobbyists. Last year in 2022, $125 million was spent on lobbyists for the U.S. Congress by fossil fuel companies. The more fossil fuel uh, representatives show up each year at the COPS, the Conference of the Parties for the UN a Framework Convention on Climate Change, those COPS that happen later in November and early December. This year, they'll happen in a country and be led. The president of the COP this year is a, is a fossil fuel executive, has been for years. It's in the UAE, it's in Dubai. They're, they're trying everything they can to stop this from happening. Uh, and you would want that if you were a fossil fuel executive. Oh, and let me mention something about the IEA. The IEA was established by fossil fuel executives back in the 70s. It was an uh, international organization to help people share information, share information about oil and gas and coal futures and, you know, basically become the think tank for the fossil fuel industry. And now the head of that, Fatih Beral, is as Jenny pointed out in her presentation, proclaiming that this is that we have to end fossil fuels if we're going to save this planet. So that's how far things are starting to turn around and turn against fossil fuel, the mining and the use of fossil fuels. But it is a huge lift. It's a huge lift for humanity. Um, everybody has to be involved in this in one way or another. This is the way uh, we're proposing is a good way to be involved at this point. A couple of things that other things I'd like to say is uh, we talk about fossil fuels and CO2, but I've worked I worked my whole career at the Environmental Protection Agency on air pollution. As much of the the deaths that happen, the se up to seven million deaths a year that happen from air pollution around the world happen because of the burning of fossil fuels. So fossil fuels have enormous real time current impacts on global public health by, by changing over to cleaner energy sources. The only other thing I'd say is that uh, those profits, uh, Jenny, you did mention in, the, in your slides, but they made uh, $100 billion in the first half of 2023. Uh, those are the record profits that fossil fuel companies made. So we're trying to change that. Uh, it, it's a big lift, like I said, for humanity. So what I want to do is actually dive into a few of the things that are in that guide that we developed, you know, demonstrate what you'd be looking at, uh, how, to, how to evaluate the investments you might have uh, or your family might has, have uh, to see whether they're worth keeping or moving to, you know, getting out of, uh, as well as identifying ones that would be good to get into uh, because they have higher ratings in terms of the uh, in terms of our values, not just fossil fuels, but maybe not investing in war, investing in companies that are uh, that take gender e equity as a as a serious value, and so on. So, so this is the guide that's uh, climate and money guide to fossil fuel divestment and reinvestment. It was developed by a committee. Jenny Ratcliffe led that, and we've revised it recently. I'm going to be uh, fossil free funds first. So let's let's go to fossil free. If you clicked on that link, you would end up here. Are your savings invested in fossil fuels? So you can search by the name of the fund, either the written out or by its ticker. The ticker actually gets you there faster, I think. Uh, but it also has this thing, top rated funds. So here are, so it tells you to get started. Here are the the top rated funds, they get an A for the amount of investment in fossil fuels, that's 0%. The sustainability mandate, which is a, a series of guidelines that they've followed that uh, give them a check mark there. They have not invested in fossil finance, this Amana Growth Institutional, nor have they uh, invested in fossil insurance. Both the financing and the insurance are critical if you're going to make do any big projects, including those carbon bomb projects that are being funded right now. 
Uh, they're part of the Clean 200 Index, and their net assets are here in the category is, uh, I, I'm not an investor, so I don't know what that means too much, but uh, that's this gives you a list of places you could go. Let's let's look at where you might be right now. So I'm going to go back to the main page here, and I'm going to search. Uh, I decided to pick out four funds that are Vanguard funds. Vanguard has done a lot of investing in fossil fuels, but they also have funds that don't invest in fossil fuels or in other areas that might be important to you. So the great thing about this particular tool is that it gives you, it not only gives you a sense of how much or how little they're investing in fossil fuels, but it also in a number of other areas that you might be interested in, military, defense spending, uh, tobacco uh, spending, and so on. So let's, I'm going to type in this one. This is a Vanguard uh, VAG VX. It's Vanguard Advice Select Global Value. Don't ask me what that means. I'm not advising that you invest in any of these. I'm not an advisor. I'm just showing you how to use this tool. So let's search for that. Here it comes up. Oh, it gets a D for fossil fuels. 8% of it is in that. Uh, it is not part of the sustainability mandate. This, by the way, tells you a little more about that. This is fossil finance, fossil insurance. It actually doesn't invest in fossil finance, so none of the banks or the insurance companies that, uh, or some of the insurance companies that invest fossil fuel. I'm going to check the compare over here because I'm going to add some other ones here, and we'll see what that looks like. So let's do the AIGX. So let's see what this one is. This is the Vanguard Advice Select International Growth Admiral Index. Ah, A gets an A for fossil fuels. It gets an A for fossil finance and fossil insurance. These are the net assets, and it's the uh, foreign category. I'm going to add that to the compare list. It, as you can see down at the bottom, it, I can load up to four funds here. Let's do ADGX, and then add that one. And then we're going to do, this is VEN. AX. This is an energy fund that Vanguard has. So now you've got it gets an F because guess what? It's all invested in fossil fuels, uh, but it doesn't invest in fossil finance or fossil insurance. It's all in energy. Okay, so let's look at the. Uh, let's go ahead and go down at the bottom left. You do compare, and here are all those funds side by side. Now you could do this, of course, with. Lots of different funds, not just these Vanguard. I'm just doing this because it's easy. And you can see it gives you a lot of detail about the fund, the fund family. This is stuff you could take to a financial advisor if you don't want to do it yourself. Uh, I don't necessarily, I have no idea what a lot of this means. So I depend, I would depend on an advisor to advise me on where to go with this. You can say it, it does a, this is this is where your values grades come up. Fossil fuels, fossil finance, insurance, deforestation, gender equality, uh, civilian firearms. So you're not funding the firearm industry, prison industrial complex, military weapons and tobacco. These are the values that they are investing in at this point uh, or that they show in their comparison. So as you can see, some of these are A's, a lot of them are F's for the different things. Uh, depending on the funds, these will show up. So that, that gives you an idea of how easy it is to find what your particular fund, if you have you know, any income or any uh, mutual funds, this is very useful for finding that information. Um, one of the things that Third Act talks about is those of us 60 and older, which many of us on this screen or on this meeting are, uh, uh, are hold about 70% of the uh, wealth of the US. And so that's one reason why those of us in older in the older category, it would be useful to know about this tool. Next, I'm going to show you, this is invest your values. This is, this is also connected to the fossil fuels divestment thing. So they use the same, this fossil free funds uh, uses a similar, you know, the same tool essentially to look up your investments and compare them. Now, let's talk about moving your money away from the, the key bank, the banks that 
that Jenny pointed out, Citibank, uh, JP Morgan Chase, Bank of America and Wells Fargo, the big four that are doing most of the funding of fossil fuels in this country and globally. There is a, if you click on the move your money link there in, in our uh, guide, you'll come to this and it gives you a number of tools and uh, campaigns that including the third act campaign that uh, walks you through this process step by step. Uh, my wife and I moved our money out of Wells Fargo after having it in when Wells Fargo was named Wachovia and years before that because of just because of this. And it took us quite some time, in part because we had our daughter, you know, our daughter got her bank account when she turned a certain age uh, and it was connected to ours. But it does take some time. You've got to pull out if you've got any automatic payments or deposits that are going into those accounts, obviously you're going to have to make changes in those. We moved ourselves over to this to the self-help credit union and the state employees credit union. Credit unions are are for the most part better because they're not being, you know, they're not, they don't have the kind of resources to invest in big fossil fuel projects. So and they do and they oh and Dale and they do mostly they do loans. I mean that's what they're there for. They're not yes. really in they're not investment in in um, companies. They're they're loan or they're, they're more like a loan organization, aren't they? Yes, and the credit unions, which means they are owned by the the members of the union. Yeah, right, uh, right. So right. Um, you can you can affect uh, their policies more directly, and they're usually more locally oriented. Yeah, right, right. This is a step by step for moving your money, organizing. They talked about organizing yeah. cohort. Uh, we'll talk about this towards the end of the meeting, but getting a group of you together uh, to do this uh, will make a difference. Uh, it helps you get through some of the, the steps. You can ask questions of each other, help each other out as you do, do this process. So it's a sort of a support group and uh, advice group uh, as you move through this process. One of the, I think one of the important parts is to, is the letter that you write you know, writing to the CEO of Wells Fargo or, or Citibank or whatever and telling them why you're doing it. And in your own words is even better than using a kind of boilerplate or something. And Third Act has some of those boilerplates, but yeah, a personal message is good. We actually had some good discussions or, you know, I wouldn't say they were lengthy discussions, but we did when we sat down to finally close out our account or start the process, we always mentioned why we were doing that. To the, to the person, we say, you know, we know you don't have any uh, say over where Wachovia spends their money, but we just wanted to let you know why we're doing this. They were good customer representatives. They listened to ten people <laughs> who didn't know, they didn't uh, telegraph what they wanted or, you know, what they believed or not. But uh, you probably could have a good conversation. Depending oh, on I, I have, yeah. yeah. Okay, let's talk about credit cards. So this is find a socially responsible <laughs> link in the thing. Screen America, finding a socially responsible credit card. This is, uh, th there's lots of them out there, uh, not necessarily associated with your local bank. We have our credit cards right now are only with the self-help credit union and, the, uh, and with the state employees credit union. But there are others out there that... Uh, uh, that are environmentally responsible uh, in a lot of different ways. So, you know, climate, food, finance, labor, social justice, mm -hmm. green, these are all things that can be um, part of your value system in choosing that credit card. I think that's pretty much it. If you want to stay in touch with us, that's the best way to do it. I think it's going to come through Lynn Lyle, and uh, Lynn will, will, will um, let me know about that. And then again, this recording... For any any anybody that didn't come that you'd like to share, it will be posted um, in a, in a couple of weeks. And then just to finish up, I, I'd just like to say because this has been a lot of information, full you know, a lot to digest. But um, in in a Quaker uh, meeting, we we be, we open our meetings in um, in silence and we end in silence. And I'd just like us to have um, together. We're just so appreciative to have all of you to attend, but. Let's just have a moment of silence together and I'll just break it in just a teeny little bit. <laughs> 